So the main idea of the paper was to describe to, of the second one was to look at various different models by changing some of the simplistic rules in the cellular automata and look at uh, explore those behaviors. Um, I want to go over a bit of, on the terminology that was in the papers. Um, but first, let's think of a few different kinds of cellular automata. So at the beginning, we have the one-dimensional cellular automata. We have the two-dimensional. So things can happen on a screen. Um, as a model, it might seem a bit silly. Why choose this model? It's mostly for historical reasons. And that's one thing you should keep in mind. Um, it reminds us pixels. If you saw all of these figures, uh, at some point it used to be really high tech to have a screen with pixels and things you could draw on. So that was a big motivation behind the study of cellular automata. But we can actually learn some really important things. So, and even if we wouldn't and necessarily use it to model things now as it is, as a simplistic one-dimensional cellular automata. Uh, we can still uh, get some really good intuitions and apply a modified version of maybe the symbolic systems that were mentioned in the second paper, or some other modification of it uh, in whatever complex system that we start. Uh, so first, to describe a few things that were mentioned in the papers. So um, most of the the, the core idea of cellular automata is that we have some, uh, we have a grid or we have a, a string where the, uh, some characters, there are some spaces where we put things, the black and white squares you see. Uh, in the simplest case, these could be zeros or ones. And we could draw them with black or, or white squares, but there's no strict requirement for those to be such. Uh, we could have uh, an alphabet, a letter, or um, numbers, or whatever. Uh, and other important parameter here is time. All cellular automata, or at least uh, one way of viewing them, is uh, evolution through time. How this string changes the graph through time. And uh, by convention, we always depict time increasing downwards. So these are fixed, um, and in a discrete and time period they are replaced. So this is replaced by something that's going to be 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, whatever. They are replaced. And each time we go into a new state. Um, the rules of transitioning are what define the cellular automata. And um, here we have two important parameters. One is for each, so let's say we focus on, on this one. We want to figure out what this is going to be in the next time step, p plus 1. It's going to be a 0 or a 1. Um, the, the new state of this depends on its old state, what, what's here, plus a number of neighbors, so what are these. Um, here in this example, the number of neighbors is, the parameter r here, is just one neighbor from each side. But you can imagine, since we are making up this system, we could taking account all of them, or more. And uh, I don't know, maybe um, uh, a pumpkin pie and a turkey ago, we did see a very similar model last time. Uh, do you remember, we had a K parameter there. Does anybody remember this model? It was the second model we talked, we had to read last time. Um, anyway, so it, uh, there's a very, so this parameter tells you how much things you need to take in account to predict your future. If you have a series of letters and you want to know what this particular letter is going to be next time, do I take into account only what it used to be, just its neighbors, or many more neighbors? Intuitively, you can guess that the more neighbors you take into account, more complicated things would happen. Uh, and this was what in the previous model was described as ruggedness. ruggedness. So the, the state space is not small. Um, since we mentioned state space, can somebody remind me what is the state space of a system? It's usually the set of allowable states of the system. Of one possible state. All possible states. So what would be a state space of this system? So it seems like, how many do you have there? Six? So it's like six. two to the six. Exactly. Um, and because it is hard to draw, it's the fast sketch with just two to the two, maybe. If we just had a subset of this system, a 0 and a 1, it could be 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So we have a, a square. 
So our system could be here, 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 or here. There are four possible states. And here are the many more. Um, and uh, if we know the rules of transitioning, we know any trajectory here, we could draw any trajectory in the same sense. So if we pick our rules to be that, um, we keep R now equal to just one name. We keep things as simple as possible. So what is going to happen here, it would only depend on these. So how many rules we would need for such a system? Any other guesses? If we want to describe everything, we would have to go and say, if you see one, zero, one, and you're in the middle, you become zero, zero, zero. If you see one, 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 you become uh, one, zero, one. You see? Yeah, zero, you become whatever. Just up things. So we have a list of rules. We, we need to cover all these possibilities and give all of these there. If we have the full set of this, we can uh, draw a trajectory in our state space. You can't like, do the three to three, though, can you? Because um, the, oh, yeah. the outside ones depend on their neighbors. So we're looking at the center. Um, so these, you're right. So these, they, we don't know what these are. These are, these would depend on what is the other neighbor. Because we don't know what this can be. This depends on the other neighbor that is here, plus this one. Right? Um, so once we know the full set of rules, we can go back to our highly dimensional square and say that if I start from here, I'm going to go there, there, and back again to the beginning. Um, you remember we talked a bit about a few different types of trajectories in these spaces. Does anybody remember what were those? So what kind of trajectories you could see? Just one, what, what we could see if we start from a random point is a stable fixed point. Stable all trajectories go to Yeah. They all, and so it would be like this. They all go to the other, the other one was what I just drew. And we could have more complicated chaotic patterns. Uh, so all of these hold true for the cellular automata also. Um, some other things that we need to talk about is uh, uh, in the paper, there was one word mentioned, a totalistic rule. Um, this means that we just average uh, across all neighbors. Um, instead of taking into account that this is my right and my left neighbor and they have a different effect, we just average what's going on um, around. Uh, other keywords that were mentioned in there we should know about. Um, I think that's all. So um, some other important concepts that uh, that are related to cellular automata. Um, so historically, we didn't have only these uh, one-dimensional ones. We had two-dimensional ones. Has anybody heard of the game of life? I actually have it right up here, right now. <laughs> nice. Yeah. It seems to me that there's a general case, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of simplicities which are still represented by the general case. For example, the two-dimensional structure mm -hmm. is really just, could be thought of as just a long one-dimensional structure. That is, if I just lay out, let's say it's uh, four by four, I could just have a 16 long structure, which has the same element. And the neighbors are the same close, neighbors. but they're, they're a specific distance. So I could represent the same dynamic oh, okay. structure so, so you mean by one dimensional. You would have these as neighbors, and these as neighbors make a more complex pattern well, of neighbors. The neighbor from the last one down to the bottom one, okay, the first one to the next one, yeah. is the same as a connection between the first one and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So if I want a one-dimensional structure, it can rep it can effectively have the same dynamics as any two-dimensional. The thing is that we wouldn't call this anymore a one-dimensional. So
So we could make. Uh, You're just saying that we could make this, which is a line of many uh, elements, right. and then make choose who is neighbor. Who I'm saying who. Uh, if you go seven off with the neighbors, then you actually have we represented have a two dimensional down to one. And this has a if our two D space is finite. It only works if your two two D space is bounded on each side. If the two D space can extend forever, then you can't. But the one dimensional space is just as unbounded. No, no, an infinite one dimension maps to an infinite. Doesn't map to an infinite. If it's discrete, it maps just as much to an infinite two dimension. No, because like when you when you're mapping your two D to the one D, you're saying look at um, neighbor plus sixteen. In my like 16, oh, so you're saying the neighbor mapping. Infinite plus 16. Okay, then you'd have to have a diagonal map to map the 2D to 1D to get neighborish. Okay, I see your point. Never mind. I was wrong. Um, but you could have more complicated than just 1D or 2D mappings. You could pick arbitrary neighbors. Uh, weight combination and then we actually have a network yeah. of neighbors. And you, you can imagine a hexagonal grid instead of a square grid. Yeah. Uh, or a and actually for the game of life there are variants of uh, hexagonal mm -hmm. cool. uh, So going back to this, um, that was another famous simulation of the same type. It was a cellular automaton on a grid. And now uh, instead of having just a single dimension, we have uh, a chessboard where each uh, square can be occupied by a zero or a one, uh, and we can represent this again with a black or a white square. Now the rules are, in this case, are slightly different. Um, the idea, that's why the name Game of Life, it's supposed to represent in some sense something alive. So if you have a one, you're alive. If you have a zero, you're dead. So this is alive. And we want to figure out what it's going to be in the next generation. So the rules here is you're going to be alive if you have um, two or three neighbors that are still alive. So at the next time point, you're going to be alive. Um, if you have more than three, you're overcrowded and you die and you go back to zero. Um, if you have exactly three uh, and you're empty, then you, you get reborn, I think. Which is yeah. Each cell with three neighbors be populated. And um, was there asked one? Can you get one neighbor you die from all these? Yeah, less than, uh, less than two. Okay. Um, so, yeah, less than two, you die from all these, two to three you survive, more than three overcrowded, and three exactly you reproduce. So, this is um, this was one more attempt of the same type, which gives really interesting behaviors. And, uh, there is really low chance, I think, for anybody to guess what kind of behaviors you would guess you would get from these rules. And this is the importance of the cellular automata. Uh, not that we would use the game of life to really study the population, or we could up to some level of abstraction. But the most important thing we get out of it is that from a really sim simple set of rules, we get important, um, interesting behaviors. And uh, for many of us, we, we actually need to simulate the whole thing to see what is this pattern that is going to emerge. Um, how these are going to spread out, in what shape, and things like that. And you can think of it as some sort of um, an integration. If you want to figure out what is the curve under, uh, what is the area under a curve, uh, you need to, to integrate, you need to go through and calculate what is this surface. So in an analogous sense, you can imagine that in order to figure out some patterns that you see in the end, you need to go and actually simulate the, the process and see what happens. Um, so let's go back to the first paper. Um, there was a distinction about four different types of uh, behaviors we see. Uh, does anybody remember which one were those? Four rough groupings. Yeah. Is it like the ones that disappear all the time? Oh, I was in that And then the ones that evolve to a fixed? Yeah. Okay. Oh. So, yeah, one were born. <laughs> The ones that don't show they are homogeneous. Right. The second one was fixed or? Yeah. A fixed and finite, I guess. Um, fixed 
So this would produce a really boring pattern. We would see these two flipping from 0 to 1, 0 to 1, 0 to 1, and that's not fun to stare for a few hours. Right? So uh, this um, intuitive categorization corresponds to a fixed and silent. Um, what does anybody remember what was the third grouping? Is it like the first indefinitely and yeah, so we have some pattern that seems to show some random behavior. So let's name those random. So there is something going on here. Uh, and this means that uh, we don't necessarily end up in a... We could sometimes end up in a fixed angle. We could just randomly drift around. We don't, there's not a clear correspondence here. And there's a fourth um, set that uh, the paper claims that it is the most interesting or more important, uh, which... What, what, I will describe. Is that like something with irregularity? It seems to show some sort of irregularity. Um, we we'll see some examples, and I think it, it's it's more clear when you see some examples how each one looks. Uh, but can you guess what this would maybe be in our types of trajectories we talked about before? In some cases, it could be a random trajectory. It could be um, maybe. A, a, a more it will be a traffic trajectory. We don't. It's hard just by looking at the pattern to to know what happens in the state space. But then it's something more interesting. Um, uh, also, one other important point is that <clears throat> the behavior we see it strongly depends on where we start from. So in uh, one that we talked about uh, connections here before. So if we're trying to, to do an example and compute what's going on afterwards, um, something that we sooner or later are going to come up with is how do we decide about this? And what is, are these two connected? Are, are these considered neighbors? Um, also, once we have the set of rules, uh, there is a finite number of set of rules for this simple cellular automata. And each set of rules have a, has a different behavior which we can classify in our four different types. But uh, the behavior we are going to observe depends where we start from. So, I mean, traditionally, we, we start from all the zeros and a single one. But we could imagine starting from a random point in space. And what would this mean? That we start from a, from a different point here and we might end up in a different trajectory. Because there's no guarantee that all trajectories are connected to each other. Or from any possible space, you're going to end up to any other possible space. Um, so I think now we have the basic stuff, or the important things, and uh, there is, actually there is one more thing left. Uh, so we did talk about um, cellular automata in different dimensions, we did talk about uh, the game of life, and there is one more important concept that is related to this, uh, it's called the edge of chaos. Have you heard about this? Um, so this is a concept that is somewhat related, um, because it has been described through cellular automata initially. And in this, in the game of life, we, we use the analogy of dead and alive, zeros and ones. So we think if we can use the same concept that one is alive and zero is dead, to this the one dimensional cellular automata. And try and see what happens through time. Uh, so we can imagine that uh, we have the, our set of rules, which is right here. And we have some rules, some rules from which you are alive and you die, or you are dead and stay dead, or you are dead and become alive. Um, a simple way of characterizing this set of rules would be how many times, uh, what is the fraction that you stay alive? What, what's the fraction of, of the rules, of all possible rules, that you still stay alive? So here, 
I didn't fill up the whole thing, but we can try the rest, and we can count that you have one out of four, how many. This is a, a single number that could uniquely characterize the set of all possible rules. So we can imagine uh, ordering all possible rules in a single dimension. Uh, with a variable that changes is what fraction of your t plus 1 are alive. Is this clear here? Maybe yes, maybe not. I feel I, don't, I didn't give a good um, explanation. So let me try with, another, with, um, with an example. So, how many possible rules we have here? Mm. Three. Three. Eight. Um, we can give a unique name to this set of rules. Uh, let's call this one for now. This is rule number one. And we can make many of those rules, which uh, make in the new rule, the 0, 1, 0 would give one here. Right? And this is rule number two. We can make uh, multiple rules like that. Um, and now we order these rule number one, number two, based on the fraction of ones we have here. So this, if we add up, it has this has five ones. This has three, two, and because we have an order. We can put all rules together and study the beginning. Hmm? But it's not unique. Because the, rule one no. and rule two can have the same number of yeah. lives. Their name is unique, but their number is not unique. So here we have five, three, three, two, 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 one. Okay. Secondly, you said the percent of the lives which were alive in the next one was your numbering of the rule, correct? Or your value, or whatever you call how, it. How many ones we have? Yeah. What? How many ones? Yeah, so the percent, oh, so the percent of the lives you get at the end. Um, it, it, it does not do with the beginning of the end, we don't know. The next, next exactly. cycle, it's not the percent which stay alive, but it's the percent which are yeah. alive at stage plus, plus one. one. From all your rules. Okay. And you. you could get something if you have zero here, no matter where you start, sooner or later you're right. going to end up in a boring case of every right. that. And uh, alive and dead are just the inverse. Zero and one. Yeah. So that is not unique to alive. You could order the inverse by dead. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I understand. So the idea here is that we have a continuum with the extremes. Uh, and what uh, changes through this is some macroscopic behavior. So if we take these and we um, follow, the, follow them through time, we do observe some behaviors, we can classify them as one, two, three, or four. And the claim was that uh, by changing this, uh, by going along this axis, we do see different behaviors. On the one end, we have uh, extreme uh, orderliness, I guess. Um, we end up with a pattern that never changes, or it's a very fixed pattern. On the other end, we have a complete random pattern. We have uh, black and white dots everywhere that make no sense. In between, we have some uh, more interesting behavior, and there's a big question mark on what we describe as interesting, which could be a pattern of ones that through time move towards the right and then interfere with some other ones and somehow show um, a more interesting behavior. And this is what is called the edge of chaos. Um, I think in order to better understand these things, we should uh, see some examples and see how they look. Um, did you download the um, laptop? Who downloaded it? And you have your laptops? I think we're spread out in the room. So let's have a two minute break to set up. Uh, can, one get, can someone with a computer uh, sit here so we can show things also while you try? I want to go through a series of examples to see some of these cases. Oh yeah, let's have our break and then somebody with a computer can come here. Okay, so let's uh, So NetLog is um, um, it's a pro it's a um, whole platform, but it's based on a programming language that is um, uh, fairly easy to use and fast to learn. And the 
point of it is to be able to do uh, agent-based simulations, um, which is, you can think of them as a generalization of cellular automata. Uh, it might not be the best way to show the cellular automata we're going to do now. There are other better things that I'm going to show you after. But um, we could, we we'll probably use it next week. It's good to have and see some of the data. Um, so if you start, you're going to have a window like this, uh, which is uh, an environment. It's a two-dimensional grid that you can adjust its size with these buttons here. Um, like what's the program? Netlock. No, I know, but like the, like you're opening a library, right? Um, I haven't done that yet. Oh, okay. okay. So do you s does everybody see a similar screen like this or not? Yes. Yes. Um, so it comes with preloaded some libraries. We talk much about asking. Uh, some people have made programs, some demos. Um, one of those is about cellular automata. That's why we're going to use it. So if you go and uh, under file model library. Um, under the sample models, computer science, there is a cellular automata model. In there, the second one is CA 1D elementary. If you open up this, it should look like this here. So, um, when you have our surface, two dimensional surface where things happen, we can adjust the size, maybe you want to increase the size. But the most important things are here on the left, are these rules. Do you see there are on, off, on, off, uh, different rules, and then next to them there's a pattern of uh, zeros and ones. And these are the black and white squares we saw in, in the papers. So what does this mean is that if we have um, the, the upper left, it is one, 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 and it is off. So this, the rule here is this. So you can look into the paper, pick a rule, and um, program it here in order to, to see how it behaves. Um, there's also a unique naming of rules. You remember when I called rule one, rule two, rule three? That's unique, uh, there's a unique name of mapping from this to what is its name. And this is the upper, the rule switches, where it says rule 105. So this combination of rules is called 105. And these are the numbers that the uh, are mentioned in the paper. So if you look under most of the figures, there is a tiny rule 136, for example. So you can just move the slide bar to 136 and watch this rule happen. Um, important uh, uh, buttons here is try and press this, show rules. Then you're going to see in a more easy to understand graphical way uh, what I just drew it on the board. You see in the upper. There's an upper line, uh, black and green here, first one is black and white. And um, the other two important things is the setup signal, which uh, sets up your first line, and the go button, which actually runs uh, the rule. So let's see how rule 105 looks. You probably wouldn't be able to guess how this looks just from the rules, and this is, was the initial point of the paper we talked about before. So, in order to try and get some intuition about uh, the different types, uh, I would like each computer to pick, uh, each one of you pick a number from 1 to 255, so one rule, or um, use the slide bar to go there, observe it and write down or tell me in which group you would uh, categorize it. Is it the simply boring one? Is it number two? Or fixed type? Or is it number three or number four? Um, is that clear? So which one is this? Just oh, what would you say? I don't know. It's not periodic, but it's sort of predictable. So it's definitely what, what, not one, right? That's for sure. We all agree. It's definitely not Four? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, two. I guess it's two. Yeah. Let's have a four. Who thinks it's two? Who thinks it's three? Is Everybody has abstained? Is two, two is fixed cycles and three is sort of closed. This fixed points are, uh, or cycles. Three is indefinite growth. Oh, I guess this is three. This is three. 
this. Uh, but uh, you just saw it's not really clear what it is every single time. And one more um, problem is that due to the implementation of this, this is not exactly the same as the one you read in the paper. Uh, the boundaries here are different from the boundaries in the paper. But uh, in general, there would be a really good correspondence between what you see here and what you see in the figures in the paper. So let, let, let's go and spend five minutes or so where you pick a number, try and, and see if you... Just see if it's obvious in which group it, uh, it belongs. And uh, I can compare some of the
you take into account what your five neighbors do in order to make your rules. Um, isotropic, this means that um, you just look on across all neighbors, it's symmetric in a sense, you're symmetric. And you have 544 rules if you make all these combinations, it should be so. Um, so by moving this slide bar, it gives you a number of lambda. This is a description of what we said before in the age of chaos example. Uh, it is how much, um, so zero corresponds to one extreme case, one to another extreme case, and any in between, it is not everybody is dead, you don't have complete order and you don't have complete randomness, you have some sort of a more interesting behavior. So now, if, um, if you just slide the bar to different sizes, you would, different sides, you would see towards one end, just what, the boring behavior in one color. To the other behavior, you would see a huge mass of too many colors. And in between, you would see some interesting behavior. So let's try for each computer a few things and uh, let me know what you think is the lambda value for the edge of chaos. You can write up on the board. Yeah. So just try a few, judge, discuss what you think is one, what you think is the other, and uh, let's see if we can end. In principle, we should end up with the same number. Yeah. Oh, keeps going. Oh, <laughs> tendrils. Yeah. 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 One edge is uh, random, one edge is uh, and somewhere in between this is the is yeah, the what is upper edge to this like, what is colors change? It should be a um, oh, they didn't change. transition yeah. between yeah. from one to another. Yeah. So uh, there might be a few no, it change the 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 number of values that should be on the edge. So it's, it depends how sharp the edge is. So you're asking how sharp the edge is. Oh, well, so the interesting thing supposedly is a single lamp, it's a range of lamp, so it's a single value, it's a transition, you go from one to another and in between it's interesting, and the best lamp is range. Yeah. So I would guess each computer would get one lambda by out there, and if you take the average of all of those, you get exactly one. And then you know, the lowest in the average would be the bottom. Yeah, there's no way to tell the difference. So it is trying to It's not a state terrible if I take five, ten, five, ten, now, if you push one end, it's a jump. Yeah. 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 It's a jump. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
this one C is not fixable, right? But, but you never know if it's actually a cycle. Like this here could actually repeat itself here. And it's like her device. That's not supposed to fix it. I don't know. I think the game was. Oh, gosh. I'm sure. Do we have anybody? I mean, by definition, it's going to be determinist or whatever. Anybody? We got a lambda 5.5284. And it becomes a, um, it starts out as totally chaotic-ish, and then comes into a totally fixed pattern. Any other guesses for Lambda? Any other points you found? 0.3246. We've got 3646 as, what? 0.3646. Yeah. Other numbers? I think it's You start changing something. By the way, that was a 32 state complex structure. That's yeah, so the, so the first one seems to be all from the rest. It's an outlier, and the reason is that uh, there is a different number of rules. So if you change the number of rules, um, the behavior changes. Uh, if you play it around, you, uh, what, what did you, what you what is the interesting thing you observe here? Why, why we use this fuzzy concept? Interesting. What does that mean? Um, if this was a real system, let's try and do more. Describe in a better way what we mean by interesting. That we, because we have been using this <coughs> quite often. So we know for sure it doesn't end up in a fixed point. It doesn't end up in a cycle. You might see. Um, Patterns spatially emerge. Uh, so there are some properties that the cellular automata have at, at this range, such as the ones mentioned in the paper briefly. So it can do. It, it, it is assumed that this. Uh, it can do computations. It does have a memory of the previous state. So if you change something, it's gonna um, affect very, uh, very much further down in time what's going on. So these are properties that remind us what we think about complex systems. So in this sense, the edge of chaos was claimed to be important, that uh, living systems or complex systems uh, that we are usually interested in studying, they should be in this scale, in this range. Although this is an extremely simplistic example where we have a single value which we can change, but there's not always uh, such a straight, straightforward value which you can tweak in a real system and make it from boring to interesting. Uh, so it has been used mostly as a metaphor about how complex systems work. Um, so if uh, you try the fifth things here, let's go back now and, and see the game of life. So there is, uh, let's see an example of the game of life. Uh, because they have been studied very much, um, there are a number of patterns that uh, come up again and again, and there has been a systematic um, uh, description of those. So there's a knife lexicon, which you might want to have a look at. Um, which uh, uh, let's pick a, a structure. So what we see here, there's zeros and ones dots here. This is a structure that can. Uh, grow from a starting point, from a random starting point. Remember, we had the rules with your eight neighbors, and uh, you can become alive on the end, and there are many of those. So you can end up having um, dots in this, in, in this pattern over there. And this is a specific pattern that somebody, I don't know when, 
uh, saw this behavior October 2002 and described and said that this is an oscillator. So it, there is a cycle. So if you start from this point, you're going to see the same thing again and again going through phases. And uh, this is quite hard to, to guess from the beginning. It seems to be a pattern that emerged. Uh, so we do see a part of the state space uh, that we can study microscopically. And there are many of those patterns. If you, if you want to visit this website, you can have a look at a few. Uh, they're from simple to really complex and large ones. Uh, some of those are fixed points. Uh, I'm just going to guess how this would uh, behave if you have a square. Based on our rules, what happens here? Stay still. Stay still. So that's one uh, point that I'm trying to. Um, I would want to attempt to guess what this looks like. <laughs> uh, but you could do things like that. So I'll show you um, one example of, uh, of the game of life. Uh, this is another software that... Uh, the, the game of life has been for a long time now, I think in the 70s. So there are many different implementations and many small Changes. This is one really good one, it's called Goli, G-O-L-L-Y, uh, it's really fast. So you can observe here some of those patterns we saw. Um, you can have a look at uh, this. So there is this pattern here. And we are, this is a zoom out view, so we look at it from really far away. And if we run into time, we can see some interesting type of behavior. And it's called a, a gun because it shoots in a sense <laughs> live and um, So I think this is fun to look at, uh, but uh, I think it, it demonstrates really well that you can get some really complex and interesting behaviors, patterns emerge from extremely simple rules, the four rules we said in the beginning. And uh, there are other interesting Patterns that have been described. And if you think about this in the state space, it's just a trajectory where you move. It's it's a trajectory that has a specific shape. This is a very zoom out view. You can look, uh, maybe you can look more on the details. Now you can see the squares, right? Which ones are alive and which are not. And you can look at the details and. Oh, yep, so there's a square. Oops. Anyway, so there's a square that stayed for a while in the upper corner, maybe so. And then something came, and once things appear here, it matches with this. So the NetLogo library does have a game of life implementation. It's just slower than this, but you, you can try it and uh, have a look at some. So if you go again at file, uh, models library, and uh, uh, it's the same for the, after serial automata, there is the one that's called life and life 30 days. You can choose any one of the, the two you want. They're exactly the same, they just uh, slightly look different. And you have the your the buttons that you know now what to do. What to do. So you can set up a random starting point, and you can let it go. And you can observe by speeding it up or down. You can observe some of the patterns that are in the lexicon. And the squares are really obvious; they come up really fast. Another interesting thing to tweak is the initial density, and you can also draw cells. So if you stop this and then draw something that you uh, read from the lexicon and you think it's interesting or you just want to make some make up something and see how, how it works and see what this does. This explodes in four stars for example. So maybe let's spend uh, a couple of minutes trying a few things and see if you can find um, something that you would describe as a pattern.
on this display what gray versus white means? Um, the gray is that it's been created in previous times, that for white it's been created, it's been there since the last what, two times. Uh, as long as the upper one, they have got a rating form, should give uh, more details if there's something. So if you want to draw off your sense, it's going to push it away from this limit cycle and maybe try and draw off your sense. Okay. Uh, but I was curious, okay, so the, the four rules just to be uh, try to die of loneliness? Or of overcrowding? Or of overcrowding, which is one. And then uh, three, you repopulate. Yeah. <laughs> and assuming there's two, you do not. Uh, so if, if you have two or three, you have to stay as well. Stay as well. But three, you repopulate. Right. Um, okay. I was just curious, like, what kind of... So if you stop it, yeah. um, you could guess what would be there. So we have three, so there's gonna, one going to be born in the green side. So then there's going to be born one here, one there, one here, one there, and uh, okay. four. And then at that point, this one will have two. Mm -hmm. And these two are going to die. And then so that one will die. Yeah. Oh. And now that's gonna the small green is gonna appear in the next one because it has three, but the other two died out. I wonder. And this one never dies because oh, I see. This always have two. Because this one technically has two, and so these are born. But when these are born, it has four, no? They're discrete three points, so it never actually has four. But I'm saying if you have eight. 
Grail is created last turn? Oh, yeah. died. Um, I think Marcus said it was created last turn. Created last turn. And these are about to begin. The green, I think, are about to begin. And why don't you watch the So if in the info, they should have. Uh, oh, yeah. 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 It's just some PNAS, like this one the last time. Okay. Uh, let's say you have a new one. Oh, you have a new one. Okay, so did everybody have some time to play around and see a few different patterns? Oh. Um, let's now discuss a bit about what does this mean. Um, it's sure fun and you can spend many hours with them. And the shape is Okay, so let's uh, let's get back and uh, try and think what does this mean. We saw an, a large number of uh, hey guys. Let's get back together and finish this discussion, and then we can go on and further home with this. Because there are many things you can spend hours and hours. There are many more models, and they're all really fun to look at. Um, but I, I want to, to spend a, a few moments just thinking what does this mean in the context of complex systems, um, which is how do we how do we build models. Um, I think we do have some time. So does anybody want to try and think why we include this in the lecture? Why talk about cellular automata? What we can do with them? Would anybody be interested in working on cellular automata? I guess why? Uh, it's something fun, a game, or artistic maybe. You can get some intuitions. But uh, in relation to the second paper we read, there were many more extensions to the cellular automata. We could have uh, uh, things where the active cells are moving around, so we could might make more modifications of those. So if, if you have if you have your system that you're studying, which could be something completely different, you could probably think of it in uh, a modified version of a cellular automaton, where some entities do have a behavior that could be described with rules. Sounds a bit similar to you have a one system you with two implementations to run and you end up having a similar similar overall pattern while each individual is different. They're in different places but they they are always square or they're always lines that move like this. So yeah, th this is one idea. And uh, uh, can anybody else think something some different implementations of a cellular pattern? Mm -hmm. Charlotte's like a vision model is kind of a Fit it into a cellular. Do you want to describe what we're discussing? Sure. So, uh, Sean's segregation model is played on a grid very similar to this. And um, what it says is like you have kind of two different agents um, the, the black uh, agents and the white agents. And let's say that each center agent um, wants to live in a neighborhood where the majority of agents of its neighbors are like it. I think there's a Yeah, I think it's okay. Uh, and so, the, so it's looking at all of its neighbors, just like a cellular automata, and it has a rule where it says, okay, if enough of my neighbors are like me, I'll stay put, and if not, I'm going to move somewhere else. And, and when you uh, run this model, what you can find is that even when people's threshold for the, their neighbors around them, so let's say you only want to live by like 
you know, 40% of people like you, which means you know, you're, you're pretty open to diversity. Um, you still get uh, really stark segregation. And so we applied this to um, like cities like Chicago, which see really, really strong segregations when you look at populations. The south side of Chicago is predominantly uh, African American, whereas the north side is um, predominantly white. Um, and so some people can look at that, some political scientists or social scientists can look at that and they can say Chicagoans are very racist. What uh, Shani showed is that um, because of uh, these simple rules, you know, people uh, independently can be incredibly um, diversity welcoming. You, know, you, only, you, you only want to live by people, only, you only want to live, your, your only requirement is that 40% of the, your neighbors are you know, like you, which isn't that bad, um, but you still get segregation. So it was a really uh, powerful uh, tool to kind of explain some of the behaviors that we see in the world. Yeah. Actually, another way of creating this is that if you're slightly racist without even realizing, you can end up in the same pattern. <laughs> uh, um, so there are many real life cases where cellular um, data can be used. And in, uh, I, in, I think this is either the same model or a very similar one that you can find. Um, one point that I think is very interesting though is uh, the ways in which we can relax the very strict conditions of a cellular automaton. So being in two dimensions, for example, because it's easier for us to draw it. Uh, having always some uh, rules that are predefined about what you do. Uh, so once we relax one by one all these things, we move and we, we don't have any more cellular automaton. We have uh, an agent-based relation which um, we, we mention those next week more, but I want to transition and think about those things. So we could imagine having agents that could probably merge and become one thing. We can't really represent this in the cellular automaton, but uh, in life, if we're starting uh, some population dynamics where populations split and merge, and depending on different rules, they do different things, uh, we would go and implement it as a uh, uh, cellular automaton type of model. Um, and um, the, uh, the important thing about these type of models is that uh, what we are looking for, the behavior we are looking for, is not um, added in our model to begin with. It's something that emerges. So this pattern here, the, uh, the segregation, in the rules there is nothing about segregation. Each agent only knows or has some sort of preference. So when we go out and we want to study and understand how segregation works, it would be a bit silly. We have um, a silly approach to start by making a model which includes already segregation. Because then we don't really learn how it works. We just verify ourselves. Our preconceptions would be added in there in a more formal way and we might convince even ourselves that we, <laughs> we did find something that was what we added um, before. Um, so I think these are the two important take home messages from today. Uh, about the cellular automata, that they have been important, can be used, and what they can do with those. Um, I think these are the basics of what they want to say. Do you have any questions or things you have to discuss? Can we put some time left?